Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder on this chilly Sunday, March 6th, 2022. Hello, my name is Diana Maiden, and I am very pleased to be your worship leader today for today's service. We welcome all at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. All of you are welcome, and all of you are sacred. Whatever your past was like, whatever this present moment is like for you, we invite you to journey into the future together. And welcome all of you who are joining us via the magic of the internet. The chat box will be open if you need to get a message to us. If you are new, a new online visitor, please email our office and let us know how you found us. You will find the church email address listed in the Zoom chat. Our church website is, um, also has a great deal of information about UUCB programs and other activities. As we gather in person, things are starting to get busy again. Today is our pledge drive kickoff. After the service, pick up your pledge packet, please, at the welcome table. And today, after the service, let me invite anyone interested in membership at the church to join Belonging Ministry team leader, Robin Miller, and our Reverend David, immediately after the service in the Sky Room for new member classes. Choir members, Deborah is leading our first choir gathering in two years at 12.30 today here at the church. <laughs> you and everyone are invited to come together at, at 2 o'clock today for a community sing outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah kind, kind of a mixed message today. We get that. <laughs> And lastly, at four o'clock today, please join, or you are welcome to join, the Boulder County Sanctuary Coalition's showing of an award-winning documentary, Five Years North, followed by an expert panel discussion for the current, on the current state of immigration in our country, the United States. The link to register is in the weekly messenger, um, and then you can submit a form through that link and you will be sent a Zoom link for the film. So the suggested donation is $25, but no one will be turned away. Now, please ensure that your microphones remain muted as you join with others gathered for worship. It is good to have a busy day at church. The Reverend Dr. John Wolfe, the retired senior minister at All Souls Tulsa, put it this way. He says, there is only one reason for joining a UU church, and that is to support it. <laughs> that is not the entirety of the quotation. <laughs> you want to support it. You want to support it because, because it stands against superstition and fear. It points to what's noblest and best in human life because it's open to people of whatever race, creed, color, national origin. You want to support a UU church because it has a free pulpit, because you can hear ideas expressed there which would cost any other minister their job. You want to support it because it is a place where children can come without being saddled with guilt or terrified of some celestial peeping Tom, <laughs> where they can learn that religion is for joy and for comfort, for gratitude and love. You want to support it because it is a place where walls between people are torn down rather than built up, because it is a place for the religious displaced persons of our time, the refugees from mixed marriages, the unwanted free thinkers, and those who insist against orthodoxy that they must work out their own beliefs. You want to support a Unitarian Universalist church because it is more concerned with human beings than with dogmas, 
because it searches for the holy rather than dwelling upon the depraved, because it calls no one a sinner, yet knows how deep is the struggle and how great is the hunger for what is good. You want to support a Unitarian Universalist church because it can laugh, because it neither insults your intelligence nor your conscience, and because it calls you to worship what is truly worthy of your lives. And friends, in that spirit, we arrive and greet this new day. Will you rise in body or in spirit? And let's sing a welcome together with and for each other. share this story with you. The years ago, years ago, the Reverend Jane Jepka was the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Reading, Massachusetts. That congregation just a little ways north and west of Boston, a couple of towns over from where I grew up. It's, it's about our size and feel, but it was founded a little bit earlier. They, they date back to 1827. And Reverend Jane, like many ministers, would dig through old records and archives of the congregation, which I have to imagine were both much larger and much less well organized than ours. <laughs> Y'all have an exceptional archives team. So, so Reverend Jane tells this story. She says, in the 1930s, of course, times were tough. And at that time, our church members were accustomed to pledging 25 cents a week or 50 cents or $1 and during the 1929-1930 church year, all of the church members fulfilled their pledges of 13 or 26 or $52. But as the depression continued, our ledger books began to show tiny numbers at the bottom of each page. Five cents, two dollars, twelve dollars, and a little s for short, five cents short on the pledge. $12 short, which of course is what you would expect during a global depression. But imagine this. Imagine that more numbers appear at the bottom of the ledger. $4, $0.08, $7.30. And after these numbers, the tiny letter O, $4 over, $0.08 over, 
She says, I can find no evidence of a special appeal from the governing board. I can find no traces of public discussion. I can find only the quiet generosity of the people in our church. I read lots of historical material, but nothing touched me more than that dusty ledger book from the 30s high up on the shelf. In our church during the Depression, for every pledge that fell short, one of many generous people overpaid theirs. I love the history of this church. Gandhi, never a member. Mother Teresa did not belong, just regular folks. They dedicated their babies, just like we do. They worshiped. They reached out to do their part in the world. They cared for one another. They kept this place going. They tried to live their best lives. When that church in Reading was dedicated, these words were spoken, and they are as true for us now, centuries later and 2,000 miles west, as they were then. My friends, let us not forget that the church of the spirit must be forever building. You, you are linking your personal religion to the spiritual life of this whole community. And in this high endeavor, Godspeed, so may it be for us. If you are joining us online um, and have a candle or a chalice near your computer, please get it ready to light. We invite you to type into the chat box where your chalice is lit the street or the neighborhood, or what city, if you are joining us from outside of Boulder County. Now I'd like to invite Whitney Wheelis and Jim Rao to light this morning's chalice. Good morning, my name is Whitney Wheelis. And my name is Jim Rao. We have been members of UUCB since 2010. What first brought us to church was the desire to have a religious grounding for ourselves and for our young boys. What we found was a spiritual home and a caring faith community. It is good to be together, to be connecting with people. These last year, two years, almost to the day of Boulder's shutdown on March 13th, have been so hard. As I reflect on these pandemic times, I am struck by the loss, the anxiety, the uncertainty and the isolation. Yet, I am also struck by our resilience, by our strong ties to each other, by our care for one another, and how important this church community has been, currently is, and will continue to be. Recent gatherings at church have shown how important seeing people in 3D is, as opposed to the myriad of Zoom calls. At a recent work gathering, outside and in person, I almost felt giddy seeing my work colleagues and friends in person for the first time in two years. Time together is so important. We have learned connection and community are essential. Today is the start of our annual pledge drive that Jennifer Skandaleski and I are co-chairing. It's a time to consider what this faith community means to you personally and to make a financial commitment for the coming church year, which begins on July 1st. So rewinding to last June, I entered that year, or this year, as the president of our board of trustees. And I couldn't help thinking about the year ahead as it was gonna be a time of rebuilding. COVID would be behind us. We'd have a fantastic new minister. We had an amazing congregation full of talents and goodwill and time to volunteer. And we had just built and were building a, a new digital capacity, which expanded us way beyond these physical walls. Well, knock on wood, uh, eight months later, maybe we're there and <laughs> starting that, <laughs> that corner. Well, I'm handing over to Will Crop here at the end of the, the church year. Um, but I can't help but thinking that the theme we have for this pledge drive 
emerging stronger together really couldn't be more apt to where we are right now as a church and what we can offer the community. So now is really not only a time to think about your commitment to this community and the many benefits you receive, but also to think about building a community for others who are not here with us yet and who will be in the future. So as Whitney mentioned, we visited UUCB in 2010, thinking about finding a spiritual connection, mostly a place for our kids. And I distinctly remember this. After picking up the religious education pamphlet, there was a little pamphlet with the rainbow version of our seven UU principles. Red, respect all beings. Orange, offer fair and kind treatment. Yellow, yearn to learn, etc. I remember looking at it and thinking, is this for real? <laughs> How can anyone argue with these values? And it really just resonated w with us and, and stuck with us. So, you know, it, it, it's so obvious that our faith is, is really so accessible and has so much appeal to everybody. And we really have to help find others, get others in the community to share those values and to join us at this congregation. Jim and I know how important this community personally is to our mental well-being, to our connection with loving and justice-minded people, and to our spiritual growth and in living into our values. Because of this commitment, we choose to support UUCB at a visionary level. Using the Fair Share Giving Guide, you can decide what level of support you wish to make to our community and to our future. If you are here in person today, they may have already found you and given you your packets. If not, you can pick them up um, out at the table after the service. If you're joining us and not in the building today, we'll be mailing the packets to our pledging members and friends. So let's talk turkey. <laughs> so having been on the board now for two years, I am keenly aware as we challenge ourselves to balance the budget that it takes money to pay our staff, support our facility, to spread our message into the wider world. So as we embrace this pledge and this theme of Emerge Stronger Together, I encourage you to put your money where your heart is and contribute as deeply as you can. We light this chalice in honor of our commitment to our UU values and our faith community and for the future bringing love and light into this world. Thank you. We now invite all of those gathered in our various locations to join together in fellowship and community as we say aloud together our congregation's covenant. We gather in fellowship to speak truth to each other, to reach out and touch one another, to care with each other, and to seek the truth divine, so be it. I invite you into a time of stillness and a time of centering, a place for prayer or for meditation, time for listening. We'll begin all by taking a breath together. And another, but slower, letting ourselves root down into the earth. Our lives are woven together of so many things. Mindful in the gently falling snow and the silence that it offers, the stillness that it offers outside and within us. Enjoying the peace of this morning, the quiet of this morning and mindful that half a world away, 
people are waking up in subway stations, sheltering from the shelling, mindful that at this hour, there's a war, mindful that in this moment, evacuees are finding children and going as families, trying to make it across borders, mindful in this moment that people are saying goodbye to each other, not knowing how or when or if they'll see each other again. And in that, in all of that, our heart breaks. And that is our connection, that is our essential humanness and humanity. The compassion, the heartbreak and the heartache. Thinking of all those affected. Our hope and our prayer today and every day is for peace. Peace in our hearts and peace in our community, yes, but peace in the world. Peace among nations. I offer these words for meditation from the Reverend Teresa Soto. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that can't dissuade us. We don't always know just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in a wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath the foundation of our values and ethics. We are the people who return to love like a North Star and to the truth that we are greater together than we are alone. And our hope, our hope does not live in some glimmer in the distant future, indistinct. Rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream and by covenant and the movement forward of one right action and the next. We know that one day we'll arrive at home, we'll be together in silence for seven breaths. Each week in the service, we set aside a time in ritual to recognize the joys and the sorrows that we each carry with us into this house. Each week in the service, we set aside a time to remember the fullness of our lives and to witness the complexity of each other's. And so in that spirit, before me is a tray with ordinary, extraordinary dirt. It is the earth of this place. Cottonwoods, mulched by prairie dogs and burned by fire and watered by snow and thunderstorms, into which we place stones, little bits of the mountains from the Boulder River. In they go, symbolizing the way our own cares and hopes take their place among each other, take their place among all those of the community, held by something larger than any of us. For those gathered here in person, I invite you to come forward down the left aisle to place a stone, to feel the weight, the coolness of it in your hand, and then place it into the earth. And for those gathered online, I invite you to share in the chat as you're moved a joy or a sorrow.
Years ago, I went for an early spring retreat weekend north of Minneapolis. This is when we lived in the Twin Cities, a hundred miles north, surrounded only by farms and forest, all the way from there to Canada and probably on up to the Arctic Circle. I saw fresh bear tracks, I heard owls. Both of those things were very fascinating before living in Boulder. 
where the, neither of those are that special anymore, I guess. Uh, I walk down these long country roads where the blocks are a mile long on every side, and I love that part of the country, though I always felt like an outsider. I was conscious of that, walking past farm machinery, these huge things that I have no idea what they do whatsoever at all. I was a tourist, right? person who came with appreciation and respect, but not someone who belonged there. So on an afternoon ramble, nowhere in particular, I happened to see between the edge of the road and the start of the trees, maybe 20 feet back from the road, there was a patch of mown grass with a sign that said Elm Park. And it was a roadside cemetery with only one plot. The low fencing, you know the, the little low fencing that you use to keep rabbits out of your garden? Surrounded this two foot square of a little flat headstone flush with the ground that was still covered with the old leaves from fall that had never been cleared. And sun and winter had bleached the cloth flowers that were tied onto this fence, bleached them almost white. Only three letters were visible on the marker under the leaves. H W-A, H-W-A, and I thought, well, okay, here's, here's some good German immigrant in northern Minnesota. And I knelt down, and I cleared the rest of the debris, and letter by letter, the rest of the name appeared, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z, Schwartz. <laughs> and as I cleared away the rest of the stone, I saw the full name, Charles Schwartz. 1917 to 1999. Well, my grandfather, of blessed memory and not of Minnesota, was Charles Schwartz, Schwartz born in born. 1917. And if this was a scene in a novel, I would find the coincidence much too outlandish to be remotely believable. But there, <coughs> the woods in Minnesota was this distant cousin, perhaps unknown kin who shared the name and the birth year of my own grandfather and whose body lay under grass and leaves and weathered silk flowers in the space between the road and the trees. And then, and then I was not a stranger in that place anymore. I was not an outsider. I was not a tourist. I was family, maybe very, very distantly. But do you know that feeling where, where some, some like inward misalignment slips into place? A spiritual chiropractor lines the bones in your back right into place again, and there's something solid for your soul to stand on. And you belong just exactly where you are, just exactly as you are. Even if you've never been there before, you already belong. That transformation from a stranger to someone already home without knowing it is the invitation and the promise our congregation offers to each person who steps through its doors. And the congregation, the congregation, of course, I, I say it as if it is something other than us, but it isn't. It has no substance, no reality, no existence apart from each and all of us together. The improbable fact of this community is that we make it for each other. There's no grave marker that signals belonging, but only each of you who create it for each other. And we arrive in this house not as consumers looking for a bargain, but as co-creators, each of us, part of a whole which is bigger than any of us. You are the space makers, the door openers, the compassion embodiers, you are the ones who listen each other into speech because you know what it's like to have been silent too long. You are the ones who warmly welcome the newcomer because you know what it is to be a stranger. You are the ones who share hope because you have walked through the dark night. In the Oxford English Dictionary, that compendium of obscure words and their origins, there is only one single reference to the word respair, respair, R-E-S-P-A-I-R, respair, 
and it's from the Scottish poet Andrew of Winton in 1425. Respair is a noun and a verb, and it means the return of hope after a period of despair. The return of hope after a period of despair. A word that apparently the English-speaking world decided it could live without for six centuries. <laughs> A lot of optimism among colonialism, I guess. <laughs> Respair, though, is a word that I see you living out, embodying and moving towards, hoping toward the morning. Hope renewed, reinvigorated. Respair is a recovery from hopelessness. In this community, I see Respair. I feel it in the energy of this room and the crowd of folks online. I see respair in the covenant groups meeting again in person. I see respair in those who signed up for the new member classes today. I even see respair in the annual budgeting process, <laughs> which I mean seriously because it is preparing pragmatically and fairly conservatively for a flourishing congregation. And none of those conversations among the finance team or the board or your pledge team, none of those conversations are about how we have to protect ourselves and draw in, how we need to serve the folks already here. Over and over, the conversations are how do we do this better? How do we emerge stronger together? How do we open the doors back up again? The doors which aren't just physical anymore, but online too. We are exhausted from two pandemic years, and we are hungry for connection, and we are unwavering in our determination to live into our mission and craft a community together. In spite of every obstacle, we are filled with respair. I have seen that resolve and felt it in the joyful outdoor services last fall. I have seen that in the generous deluge of support in response to the Marshall Fire. I have seen it in the resilient transition to multi-platform worship. Stephen Jim built a room back there this fall. If that's right. <laughs> if that is not hope for the future and broadening our doors, it's the AV room where all the controls for all of the things are so that we can be online. I have seen the, this respair in the love and support for Ingrid and her kids as she moved yesterday, as they moved yesterday into their own home after four years of living under this roof in sanctuary. In the months and the years ahead, we will heal and rest and work and grow and live into our mission because we're not going back to how things used to be. We're going forward, shaped by the best of our past, trusting a new day hardly yet visible, emerging. Emerging from winter, although you wouldn't really know that today. <laughs> emerging from a difficult season that's gone on two years. Emerging from separation. Emerging from pandemic, hopefully. And that can feel strange and tentative and even scary sometimes. And that's okay. We say, come into this house and bring all of who you are, all of how you feel, all of what you are here for. This is a place of abundance. When you make your pledge of financial support to the church this month, I'm not asking you and your pledge captains aren't asking you to put a price tag on what the church is worth to you. I don't rise this morning to invite you into your own private calculation of the value you derive just selfishly from being part of the community, but instead, we're inviting you that if this place is worth something to you, give a gift that creates it for others. 
Give a gift of support that makes this place possible for the next person coming in through the door, for the neighbor a half a mile away who would be beautiful here and does not even know we exist. <laughs> Create this place for each other. In just a moment, the Chancel Cats are going to lead us in Harry Belafonte's song, Turn the World Around. And the singer explains, he explains this of its origins. He says, I discovered this song in Africa. I went deep into the interior of Guinea, and in a little village, I met with a storyteller. The storyteller went way back in African tradition and African mythology and began to tell this story about the fire, the sun, the water, the earth. He pointed out that the whole of these things put together turns the world around. That all of us are here for a very, very short time. And in that time we're here, there really isn't any difference in any of us if we take time out to understand each other. The question is, do I know who you are? Do I know who I am? Do we care about each other? Because if we do, we can turn the whole world around. Do I know who you are? Do I know who I am? Do we care about each other? This is our work. And together we can turn the world around. We rise in body or in spirit. Let's sing together, friends. sunlight turn the world around we are of the spirit truly of the spirit only can the spirit turn the world around This month, our offering goes to the Alternatives to Violence Project. Alternatives to Violence Project provides training and workshops in Colorado prisons and the wider community to help individuals deal with potentially violent situations in new and creative ways. Alternatives to Violence mission is to empower people to lead nonviolent lives 
through effective communication, affirmation, respect for all, community building, and cooperation. I invite you to give as generously as you are able. You may make a donation now using the link posted in our chat by sending a check to UUCB or scanning the QR code on the next slide with your mobile phone. May our gifts be used to enact justice, bringing peace and love to the Boulder community. I love this church. Gandhi is not and was never a member. <laughs> Mother Teresa never belonged here either. For, for a whole variety of reasons. We are just regular folks. And we dedicate our babies and we worship and remember what's important in life. We reach out to do our part in the world and care for one another and try to live our best lives. My friends, let us not forget that the Church of the Spirit must be forever building and we are linking our personal religion to the spiritual lives of this whole community. And in this high endeavor, I bid you Godspeed. Amen. Amen. have gathered here this morning. We invite you to stay with us in our Zoom rooms for a time of online fellowship and discussion. Go in peace. <laughs>